and welcome back to the Nationals Modern. I am your host, Alex Kessler, here with my co-host, back Ben Bateman. We're back Whoa. together. I am a father now. Ben has a cool backpack. Uh, <laughs> as do I. Uh, and uh, this 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 uh, podcast is now on our new home, uh, the channelfireball.com website. You, uh, it is super hyped to be here. If you are here and we talk about cards you want to buy or we hype you up on a cool deck or you just want to say thank you for other purchases that you'll be making on this website or you're making or you're watching this on the YouTube channel and you're like, where should I buy cards? Channelfireball.com is the place to go. Please use the code the MMCast or click on the link uh, below this that has our affiliate link because it helps us out and keeps Channel Fireball loving us. So please, please do so. We during the pre-show, which is the other part that this uh, podcast is brought to you by and our, which is our Patreon. We have other sponsors. We'll get to those later. Our Patreon dot uh, com slash the cast as well. Uh, we did a 30 minute pre-show today uh, <laughs> that was about Star Wars. And I would maybe kill to get myself a Star Wars outlet as a content creator if I had the time, which I don't. Um, but uh, so make sure to check that out. We go through uh, our thoughts on the prequels. We go through Star Wars rankings. We talk about the best thing. It's really good. May the 4th celebration, everybody. But the thing I was going to say is talking to people that aren't Ben or very specific people in my life about Star Wars is so stressful to me because people are like one of three categories. They're good. They're a good person to talk to Star Wars about. They like have strong opinions that like, if you disagree with them in any way, they get mad at you about it. Like there's the Star Wars nerd version. And then the third one being like, Oh, I don't like Star Wars. And then like are kind of mean about the fact that you like Star Wars. And I hate, the two options that aren't the first one where it's like just fun to talk about it because it's Star Wars and who cares. So it was nice talking to you, Ben. And it's nice that our patrons are going to be able to hear that whole conversation. I agree with you. I think the Star Wars thing is, I mean, and guys, this is a magic podcast where we talk about the modern format. We're going to in just a second. We're going to be talking about the yeah, this is, this is a Canada. set, uh, uh, final set review or set review kind of part two for the most recent set new Capenna. You can see the first one. Uh, I think it was like three episodes ago where we went over the mechanics and the cards previews at that time, which include the lands, the the charms, uh, which uh, the Riveteer charm is already seeing uh, modern play, uh, the charms and the each of the different like guild leaders at the time that had been previewed. But yeah, Ben, you were saying about Star Wars. <laughs> I'm just saying it's interesting. I, I grew up. I loved Star Wars. Like I've, I've said this before in podcasts, but when the Force Awakens trailer came out, I cried. I legitimately the first trailer. I remember seeing it tears down my face. I like. Opening night, saw Force Awakens in theaters three times, like, love it, right? So excited, kept my enthusiasm, really, really, really hyped, like, all of them in theaters, um, multiple times, in fact, for almost all of them. And then it started to occur to me somewhere around 2016, 2017, that I was, like, not having that much fun identifying as a Star Wars fan anymore, because it's, like, not... That's like not space that is like you can casually exist in really much anymore. And then now we're in we're in the era of like, I don't even identify as a Star Wars fan anymore to the point that I felt like my obligation as a lifelong fan to watch all of Mandalorian and uh, and Boba Fett was like not there. Like I, I was like, if I'm missing this, I like I'm almost happier to be more casual. Like I don't care that much because like caring a lot about Star Wars, owning that is something that's not that much fun for me anymore. Yeah, I think I think like the thing that like and recently it's gotten better because we're like past to that era. But there was a moment where I have been classically very publicly with Star Wars love. There's a giant seven foot Star Destroyer charcoal painting I did in college next to me that I've had framed on my wall for 15 years, not to mention like 17 other like there's an A-wing right there. (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of Star Wars stuff around me and because of that, I was like the go to person. I have a, a red carpet cutting from the Force Awakens premiere uh, behind me. Uh, there's a lot of people that come to me with their like Star Wars opinions, especially like Last Jedi and Force Awakens. I have text message threads that are paragraphs of people being like, this is the 10 page essay on why I hated this movie. Alex, what did right, you think? And right. I, was like, I don't I liked it. <laughs> I'm right. like I I'm the guy who read all the Star Wars books but I didn't read them because I'm like these are good <laughs> like these are pieces of artwork and literature for I was like no it's dope to see Han Solo fight intergalactic biological weapon monsters again <laughs> so right, right. uh but yeah that's Star Wars We're talking about about modern new competitor is out we've gone to play with the cards um we've done done uh fun pre-release stuff we've played with the different mechanics and you play, and, a, you play a paper pre-release or a digital one a digital 
I did the, I did the I early did, streamer release. I did the paper one. I did it at the at the local shop. I went and played with Eric. Um, it was really fun. It was my first paper release in like two and a half years. And uh, I guess I don't think we did the show after I did that. And I can't remember if I talked about it on the show or not. Uh, I had a great time though. It was there was something so like wonderful about magic in person with strangers it's like the same sensation i've had since i was a kid it'll never go away for me i think as long as the game continues to be paper and it continues to have the same like you're friendly with all the people there but you don't really know any of them you guys are all relating on the fact that you love magic and you just want to have like an enjoyable experience with good games you all kind of want to win there's a little bit of like a sh- like a spiky edge to like half the people there always, but there's also like half of the people there, which like generally speaking are like students. There's a lot of students. There's a lot of people who like this is their social outlet, it's something that they do that they go and do themselves. It's fun for them, and they mm-hmm. like are kind of a shut in. You can tell they're a little shy. This is a good way for them to be social. There's like li- there's sort of almost like archetypes. I feel like I've recognized my whole life at these things, and they've been consistent my whole life. And I, I love it. I love it. So there's oftentimes there's a really young kid. There'll be somebody who's like eight or 10 or 12 or something. You know what I mean? And you almost feel like in some way you're like in a teacher moment of like instructing and helping. Like, I don't know. It's just a really unique experience that I had missed, really had missed. And Nuka Penna was a great time. Very fun. Um, I opened, uh, the, the Demir one. What's the, what's not Demir, uh, Esper one, uh, the, the Obscura. Obscura, that's the one. I opened the Obscura one. And I opened a, I got good cards in my pack. And then I, in my like second, like not my like seated pack, but in my like regular mm-hmm. packs, I opened a foil of the legend, the three mana, three mana, one, four flyer that like whenever you attack, it does that effect connives, it connives X, the legend. Yeah. So I opened that card uh, in, in foil, which was sick. <laughs> and it was fun. My deck was really good. I, I think I was tied for first in the end. I think I split. Nice. That's really good. Yeah, no, I mean, like, the, the format's really cool. I always like gold-colored sets. They're, it always allows you to do, like, really fun different things. And this set also has graveyard shenanigans, which I like. Um, I did the, like, early content release event. They, like, let the content creators do that, like, early release. I did it with uh, Tappy Toe Claws, and that was, like, a really, that was really fun. We did it with her and Michael, and we, like, drafted a few different times. I think we lost, but that's because more because I'm, bad <laughs> at that <laughs> limit uh, uh is the only thing i think i think well oh, oh oh it was what we were trying to do like the five color shenanigans i was trying to pick like every mana fixer possible and then it oh, ended wow. up we were just like in a very good jund deck and then that jund deck did really well and then the second deck was just like was midnight and late and so i went to bed i don't think i finished that round but it was really fun i like love those early pre- uh, previous events so like it's cool too because you get to play against content creators uh, and you like, it's like a pre-release, right? Like when you played the arena launches during COVID, it was always like, oh, I don't, it's just like strangers. It, you don't get that same in-person effect. The only time was during those uh, early release ones where it's like, oh, that's Tappy or that's Voxy or that's, you know, Ben right. or people we know. So that was cool. Um, I did get the open. So I've opened only three, I've opened three collector boosters of Nuka Penna so far okay. in okay. paper. And it's because they came in. This is me just bragging. Uh, Wizard sent me another cool box. <laughs> uh, this one's like a cool hat box. It's Maestro themed. Um, and it had like uh, a Maestro commander deck, three collector boosters and a set booster box that I'll eventually open that set booster box like on TikTok during a stream. But I opened up three uh, of those packs. And the first one kind of had like garbage in it. I think the rare was... Um, I would have like Ginny, uh, Ginny Faye Jetmere second, which is like the the really cool yeah. make all the tokens into two twos and three ones. That's um, but that I, I probably just showed the other card. But the other pack, two packs, the first one uh, had a foil full art Omnixilis. Sick. Which was a cold $70. And the second one had a gilded foil full art, wow. art deco Omnixilis. <laughs> so just mostly humble brags. I opened up $200 <laughs> worth of Omnixili, uh, which is the plural for Omnixilis, which is a car, a, a word we need to know because Omnixilis uh, is going to be the first car we talk about and is the makes copies of himself. You have multiple Omnixili in play. So the official plural for Omnixilis is actually an important grammatical thing we need to know. Um, and that'll be the first car we talk about in the set review. So Omnixilis, the adversary, one black, red, legendary planeswalker, Nixilis, three loyalty. 
Three Mana Planeswalker, Ben. Have these ever been good? Uh, Casualty X. Uh, the copy isn't legendary and has starting loyalty X. As you cast this spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power X. When you do, copy this spell. That copy becomes a token. So you, if you sacrifice a creature, you get two Omnixilises. I'm, I'm Nixalai. I've already messed up the, the naming convention. I'm Nixalai in play. The second one isn't legendary. You can do in, insane things, uh, Ben. Did you know that you can populate that second Omnixilis token? You can pop it. That, yeah, if you have anything that copies tokens in any way, you get t- multiple Obnixilis oh, in the play. It's not because it's non legendary. So you can correct. make multiple extra non legendary Obnixili. Yep. Uh, yep. Correct. Uh, if you have any like trigger copying effects, you also get extra Obnixili. Uh, so, so that's a fun thing. Uh, so his abilities, though, plus one is each opponent loses two life unless they discard a card. If you control a demon or devil, you gain two life. Uh, it's minus two is create a one one red devil creature token with whenever this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. And it's minus seven as target player draws seven cards and loses seven life. So kind of a win condition, kind of a, a card draw spell, depending on what you need. Um, and this card's already making waves. It's like super broken and standard. The like really crazy one is they're playing it with Essekai or Essica Chariot, Essekai Chariot, which lets you copy the tokens with Obnixilis, which is just like dumb. I'm glad, though, that Riveter's. Jund is back in standard and Jund is a top tier standard deck. Like, like the world is back to normal. And as it, as it has been written, Jund should be powerful in standard when it is viable. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, mix is just, it's a, it's a very simply powerful card. There, there is a, a litany of powerful two drops that have value when they enter the battlefield, like basic value. Also like, because it's just, it's, you know, copy the power of the, of the card, right? Like, there's a million two mana three ones <laughs> that get printed in every set ever. There's uh, there's so many like there's also like a lot of like two mana four power creatures. There's two mana. I mean, there's two mana six and seven power creatures. There's there's doing obviously you have to cheat them into play and do weird stuff with them. But like there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with Obnix list because the thing that's really interesting about this and I'm sure people have already looked this up, but like what's the name dragon hoarding not hoarding dragon. The sleeping dragon, slumbering, like, slumbering dragon. Yeah, is he big? At, or does he's he get a one five five? Slumbering dragon. Well, uh, can't attack unless has five more. Oh no, 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 okay. Whenever it's a one mana three three. There, but the, there's the, some of the dope plays. Rotting Regisaur, three mana for yeah. a seven seven three or whatever. Uh, yep. I mean, in modern, the the big ones are like Ragav- To me, are Ragavan, uh, Wild Nakadal, and Tarmogoyf. Yeah. Right. Like those are three or even in like a Grixis shell, Grixis death, like death shadow into him. Right. That lets you just like swing for seven on turn three, cast out Nixilis, sacrifice death shadow, dome them for seven. And so as long as you've dealt six the turn before or whatever in a tempo deck like that, you've now like wrecked their face. But this feels like it, it, like obviously powerful. In the old version of Superior Burning Coco, the original version that wanted to play Apocrysite before I just established that Apocrysite was just not good enough <laughs> uh, when I wanted to like Aether Vial 4-4s four in. Uh, yeah. That version of the deck, though, seems sweet where you can where an ob comes down and you can like sacrifice a 4-4 four, four Apocrysite that then just like sacrifices and then leaves and then comes back. And yeah. And and like this um, next list protects itself, right? Like it's minus puts a creature into play to protect it. It's it adds a clock. It does like kind of a pseudo Liliana. It's like bet worse than Liliana the Veils plus, but you don't have to discard. So they like can lose two life or not like. And once you get to two things a turn, right? If they're like if you have two up Nixilis in play and they plus that's that's a uh, they've now discarded two cards. And then the next turn, they probably don't have very many cards in hand. Like I, I think like there's a reason this card is seeing a ton of play already and i'm not surprised and i do think like we're just seeing the top like the beginning of what you can do with this card i mean there yeah there's so many simple plays to powerful plays there's straight value stuff like strangle root geist on turn two and then just obnicholas on turn three and then sacrifice your geist and you get a copy and it comes down with two loyalty which your geist comes back and now it's a three two and it's attacking and like that i mean th- there's a tremendous amount of stuff this card's very yeah, powerful like, like just the, just the ability to like play ragavan Having drawn your second, right? You have two Ragavans in hand. Play Ragavan, turn one, turn two, swing, make a treasure, play Obnixilis, sacrificing the first Ragavan, plus plus, or play make two devils. On the next turn, dash a Ragavan, right? Like the the play cycle with this is like so cool. Um that I'm excited. I'm excited to see see uh see what people are able to do with it in modern. 
Yeah, that's definitely, I think that's the most powerful card in the set pretty clearly, but we'll see as we keep walking down. Well, the second I don't, card, I don't know if I'll say that. It's definitely the most expensive. Uh, the next, yeah, go. The next card is Bootlegger's Stash. It is a uh, one green five for an artifact, a green artifact, mythic rare. Lands you control have tap, create a treasure token. Uh, people are kind of up in arms about this card a little bit, I think, right? Because there's a lot of conversation right now that there's too much treasure in magic. I've seen a lot of this. There's, there's both. There's kind of a conversation around too many treasures in Magic, and there's specifically a conversation on that like green shouldn't have treasures. Yeah, I mean this. There's an inevitability to this card that is interesting, and the fact that it's an artifact is probably the reason that it feels like it's pushed. Like if this was an enchantment, if this was just a green five, and it was an enchantment, and it was lands you control of tap at at a treasure. It's a much more like you just have to accelerate into this with traditional green ramp, and then you have lots of manas. But there are so many ways to make artifacts cheaper or to get additional mana early to generate artifacts. There's like a lot of different stuff you can do to kind of cheat this. You can get it fast. This does feel fairly oppressive because once it's down, if they don't deal with it right away, it's it's pretty much game over. If you have a deck that wants to take advantage of having a lot of artifacts. So I have a few thoughts. One, right, like your point on it being artifact, that is a change, right? Wizards has announced officially a few years ago that moving forward, every color is going to be getting more artifacts in color because yeah. they've realized that they want more artifacts in the game and to do artifact matter sets or to do artifact synergies, it's important to create artifacts, but doing colored ones are so much safer and better for what they're doing. So we're just going to see them now forever, right? And so we're going to continue getting that. So green's going to get artifacts that it makes. It just has to feel green. The other one is kind of, I think more the point, which is this creates a lot of artifact tokens. And I think a lot of people think like green shouldn't do that. Nothing about this card mechanically is not green, right? Other than maybe that like Omnath saves green mana for later. There's like four other different green cards that all have the ability to store green over time. Doing it on treasures is different than doing it with counters or power toughness or not letting mana, you know, leave the battlefield during phases. But all of that is a green ability. So then we come into and then the other one is token making, which is also a green ability, right? Like green is the color is the best token. It makes double tokens. It has, you know, that's all green. So it's the artifact token feature that people are kind of up in arms about, which like no one had a problem with food. Yeah, people had a problem with food because like Oko was too powerful, but no one like no one was like, ah, green making food tokens doesn't feel on flavor. Before that, no one had a problem with clue tokens in in Shadows of Innistrad. Green was the second best color at making clues. It was blue number one, then green. I do think this card is interesting because a six mana artifact that wants you to be tapping your mana to make trip. So so okay, if you spent the idea being if you get this card down. And then you mm-hmm. spend every turn tapping your lands to make treasures, right? You're turboing out a lot of treasures. And let's just pretend you accelerate into this. So let's say by the time this comes out, you have some artifact acceleration. Let's say you have four lands on the battlefield by the time Bootlegger Stash comes down. Seems like a fair assumption. Uh, now, now going forward, if you spend all of your mana each turn, you'll be able to tap four lands to make four treasures. Now you have four artifact pieces on your board. You can sacrifice the Ravagers or do whatever you want to with tap mm-hmm. for Aether Grids, like whatever, whatever plan you have. But the deck that's going to take advantage of the ramp to get this thing out early, even let's pretend it was on like three lands, like in modern, if you're going to really hyper this thing out, you have to have like some sort of infinite combo game plan to to win quickly. Otherwise, you're sitting there and dirtling and making lots of artifacts like you you're playing like a deck that feels a lot more like an old war deck or an old like just like a time save. Do it. What about time save? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's the there, there's your infinite combo, right? Like there's your I'm turboing my way into winning the game, which totally. And I think that bootlegger stash. Like I think, yeah, I think I think bootlegger stash to me is interesting as a like a one of search for your war of invention in a in a time sieve deck, right? Where you're like, I got time sieve into play. This is like if you can get time sieve into play and then on turn and, and between turn one and three, put enough artifacts into play so that on turn four you can. I guess it has to be turn five, put, put enough artifacts into play or no turn four, because if you have another artifact, you'll be fine. So so basically the game plan is turn one artifact, turn two time sieve, turn three artifact, turn four, like at the end of their turn, war of invention, bootlegger stash into play win, right? Because you play a land and then you now make land, five artifacts a turn and you have infinite treasures a turn. And you yeah, might even be able to you miss. Do. You might even be able to miss your fifth land drop and 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 like sustain like for those other turn. artifacts or the artifact lands you're playing with. Try and get yeah, figure it out how to get Just there. So drop. yeah, I I think like that's that's but that's kind of my point. I guess like that's a that's a dedicated combo deck where I think this card is cool in that deck. 
But that's there's plenty of dedicated combo decks. Where they print cards that win the game that cost six mana all the time. Like that's not a crazy thing. Yeah. It's, I think it's, I think people's biggest issue is it within Commander. I think for a lot of people, like this card is super powerful and insane, and treasures are too many. They're like there's too many synergies with treasures, and like why does green need this? And why wouldn't this be a red or a white card? And like I, from a mechanic perspective, nothing about this card doesn't feel green to me. Yeah. From a yeah. like other than that, just makes a lot of artifact tokens. Like people didn't like old Gnaw Bone either. The dragon that when it does damage makes set, you know da- equal damage. Dragons when they do damage, you get treasure tokens or whatever equal to that damage dealt i think there's like versions of a card like this that you could that they could make that would be so much more oppressive and i think the reason this one isn't is because it costs six like for instance if this card red bootlegger stash green one tap two on tap artifacts you control create a treasure token like or if it's like something like that or even if it read like like tap a land uh you know one mana tap land like and, I, and there's there if you could make okay, okay, okay is this is this a green card two mana for an yeah. enchantment, one in a green, enchant target land. Uh, when enchanted land taps for mana, make a treasure. Yeah, it does not it doesn't exist yet, but you could think you could make that card all day long. Or or or, or three mana, right? I, I mean that that's like a constructed playable one, but like the three mana one, which is that like dumb mana fixing land enchantment that like every set has the like bolster three mana enchantment yeah, enchant yeah, land yeah, yeah. Enchant, yeah. So that it just taps and makes a treasure. That feels like a green card to me, right? Like, I don't think that I don't think that should be allowed to be another color. No, that's yeah, I, I, I think I think you and I are on the same page. I think this card's cool. I think there's real application in modern. I think the cost and the, the, its interaction with time seed, but also its interaction with lots of other cool artifact, have lots of artifact, do something cool cards is just interesting. And the fact that it costs six makes me feel like, yes, you're going to probably put this in play with Whirr or you're going to be playing some big mana deck. I look forward to seeing the decks that come out of this card if. If it's a time sieve deck, like that feels like that's what the deck is built to do, and you'll be able to interact with that pretty easily. I don't think that that's going to be a big concern. And then, like, kind of the other side to me is like for commander purposes, green getting something like this. Like, I think this card would be a problem in commander if it was red, right? I think sure. it would be too powerful then. I think that that is a card that red would t- abuse really well. And talking about like like using Derevi to get it into play or Goblin Welder to get into play means you're getting it way earlier and you're playing the color that already wants to sack a bunch of treasures and artifacts. So getting that many artifacts, like having it in green means you have to play like a bug deck or a Jun deck that like is just like playing green for a few cards. I like that's, yeah, I think it's safest here. I, I, I disagree with all the haters. I do think Wizards has like hurt everyone and will not be giving green large treasure makers ever again. Or at least once, you know, since Old Nabo and the two years past that that have already been designed happens, we won't get them. But uh, I think that's wrong. I think people, people do, are wrong. People do love to get up in arms. It seems to be popular in our community. Next up, we have uh, a legendary artifact equipment, Luxior Giada's Gift. Um, it is one art, one mana, legendary artifact equipment. Equip creature gets plus one plus one for each counter on it. Equip permanent isn't a planeswalker. It's a cre- and is a creature in addition to its other types. You can equip a planeswalker for one, or you can equip it generally for three. I love this card. Before we yep. get into the fact that it goes infinite with Devoted Druid, which is why it's actually a relevant modern card, uh, I'm a big fan of turning planeswalkers into creatures, and I think it's just in general very cool. I love uh sarkon the masterless it might be he might be in my top three favorite planeswalkers of all time just the ability for him to like i also love that he does it against planeswalkers will like in my head in my head canon people are just like walking down the street like jace is just walking down the street and he just like oh, why am i turning into a dra-? and then just like realizes that sarkon is like turning him into a dragon against him he's like sarkon not again, and then like becomes a dragon. I just like really like that concept. So I really love that Luxior just like lets planeswalkers attack. And I think there's like some dumb stuff you can do there, right? And like it's playable in decks. I, th- I think this is playable in Jun decks, right? The fact that you can find this with Urza Saga and then equip it to your Liliana the Veil or your Renin Six or your Gris, like those decks are already playing a lot of planeswalkers. And this is just a marginable way to make those control cards into win conditions is dope. I think, yeah, when you the, the one of those cards that really stands out to me that you mentioned is Ren and Six, because I think the other one's costing three. They're good cards, but like spending the spending the time to cast this and equip and have somebody respond and all that. Like, I just feel like for some reason, it's a little slow. Right, it's you a tutor what? target. 
you, it's a tutor yeah. target, right? You like Urza Saga finds it and puts it into play. And so for one man on turn like five, your Liliana of the Veil is now a six, six attacking creature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but also the other thing is it makes it not a planeswalker. I, I can just imagine because Ren and Six is two and it comes down on three, right? And it pluses it pluses one up. No, no, but, but loyalty abilities can still be activated. So so by putting it on a planeswalker, you make it so that planeswalker can't be attacked, but it can still use its abilities. Got it, got it, got it. I also like just the design, Luxier. Like, like it just looks cool. The idea of there being like a sword that's like pick up the sword, Liliana, and be like a dope. Because like there is something interesting about the interaction that, for instance, we've we've from a logical logistical standpoint of thinking about planeswalkers interaction with the game, the idea of a creature and a planeswalker and like a piece of equipment or a vehicle that a creature could use that vehicle or that, that like, I guess vehicles, the wrong example, but they could use like a piece of equipment and a planeswalker couldn't pick up that sword or put on that mask is like, what? It doesn't make any right, sense. Right. From like a, from a nuts and bolts, new player perspective, I'm like, there's a character on this card and this is like a sword they both should be able to interact with the sword. That makes sense to me. It, in my head, it's always been a um, they they're too good for it because right? the flavor of planeswalkers when they die is that they're not actually dying. They're just like, oh, I've taken too much damage. I'm out. Peace. And like they're only using their abilities because they like agree to help you. And that's why like minuses are like bigger effort from them. So if they use all of their energy to do it, they're like, oh, I'm done. Thanks for goodbye. So like. But I, I agree. It is cool. It's really cool that we get to pick it. The other the other cool part about this, and Urza Saga is a part of that conversation, right? Is that the dev- is the fact that this is one of the best Devoted Druid combo pieces ever printed? Yeah. So like, so the fact that Devoted Druid equipped with this goes infinite. You make infinite mana. And the fact that now with Stoneforge Mystic and Urza Saga, you can play a collected company deck that is playing to get this combo with just playing one of these. So it doesn't mess up your like fine triggers. And Urza Saga just finds that or and then collective funk company can use stoneforge mystic as its target to find the combo piece so yeah the fact the fact that like luxier is so much better than vizier remedies is also like because that card is cool and but not very good it's good with persist creatures right that's like that version of the combo allowed you to like back into kitchen finks infinite combos well this one lets you just play like a good stone blade not like nile lightsaber deck or a, a selesnia lightsaber deck where like you're just playing devoted druid as like a cool ramp piece that can pick up a sword and then sometimes you have infinite mana and win the game yeah i mean it's it interacts pretty well it interacts pretty well with devoted druid god devoted druid it's so funny to me because there are certain mechanics that like just don't make a lot of sense in magic like they never have made that much sense in magic so like the idea of a mana creature that can untap itself in any way is just not something that like really we don't get that because like why why would mana creatures be able to untap themselves or, or yeah mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. and then also like the untap ability just in general is like something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like both of those things are just sort of wonky and they're holdovers from an older time in magic. Um, so it, it's never surprising when you see a card like that interact with a new card like this, that's cool. And it breaks a card yet again. I mean, right. the has been part of like five infinite combos now. Um, all right. So the next card is ledger shredder uh, one in the blue for a uh, one, three bird advisor with flying. Whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, uh, it connives. So uh, you draw a card, then discard a card. If you discard an online card, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. Um, so a two minute, one, three flyer. Um, Decent already. One thing I think, I think I, I forget if I said this with you, but I think that bird is like on a short list of creature types that could at any moment become a playable modern tribe. We've talked about it actually on here a handful of times. I agree with yeah. you. And they, and they, they push it more and more. Um, they don't, they haven't gone ham yet. Like we haven't gotten a set yet where it's like, okay, this is the bird set. Birds are thing. Now we've gotten a yeah. bunch of here's two birds that are cool. Uh, you know, like the two birds yeah. with one set. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I agree with you. Ledger shredder. I played against this card at the pre-release. Um, it is good. I think, connive is a very interesting ability i i definitely when i read connive in the first place before playing with it i was like oh yeah this is good like you'll always find a way to make your creature better and it's tempting to do that to always grow your creature but actually often it's just a loot and you have to have the discipline to not make your creature bigger and limited i was like every time i was like i want my creature to be bigger damage 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 but then i just kept discarding good things yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, like that, and that's the difference between limited and I think in limited, it's a much harder decision. In constructed, you build your deck to connive, right? You have lingering right. souls in your deck, or think twice, or arc light phoenixes, or you know whatever. 
you can think of that you want to put in your graveyard. And now Ledger Shredder is just out there, you know, draw getting big as a two two mana flying threat that can block pretty well, uh, block a Ragavan really well. And now your opponent is if they ever cast two spells a turn, is just like letting you grow this or draw a card or, you know, the, the benefits are really high. So. What's that card from Time Spiral? Call call the Netherworld. Is that what it's called? The it has madness zero and it's return a creature from a graveyard to your hand. Oh yeah, sure. I don't know what the card's called, but I know what card you're talking about. Yeah, there's like a bunch. The connive is an interesting with it's very interesting with madness because like you definitely they're like you get a lot of benefit from discarding specifically cards. Like it's specifically mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. find a card you can discard that is not a land. That, and so if you're already doing it and it's like free. That's even better because, like, then call the call of the netherworld. Then is like, you, I'm sure there are probably loops with connive that just makes it go forever. You'll always be able to just cycle a card back and forth, like in a dredge deck or something like that. Um, next card is Halo Fountain, two and a white artifact. Uh, you can pay one and tap it, untap a tapped creature you control, create a one one green and white citizen creature token. You can pay two white and tap it, untap two tapped creatures you control, draw a card, or you can pay five and tap it to untap 15 tapped creatures you control to win the game. Alex, I'm not so, comfortable talking about Halo on our on our show. It makes me uncomfortable. Because oh, you don't like it's it's uh, this is a show for 13 plus and that's a 21 only con- uh, yeah, concept. It makes, it makes me uncomfortable. The idea of characters in my game imbibing substances uh yeah there was a lot of like very interesting pearl clutching around around this concept in the game i get like part of it was that during the pre-release wizards made an announcement being like you can serve people cool drinks and or candy like pop rocks but don't make it in a martini glass or too alcoholic which like honestly it's good advice to not have a martini glass at any uh card store because i don't know if you've ever drank it out of a martini glass ben but um it's impossible to not spill out of one Yes, conceptually, yes. Uh, they are the most dangerous drink glass. It's a dumb glass. Should it have been invented? But um, but then people were like, like, yeah, it's angel dust and it's like drugs. I can't believe this is like I don't like Star Wars has spice in it. Speaking yeah. of Star Wars, you have like there's death sticks in Star Wars and that show is made for children. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm I'm like the Hobbit has smoking the actual weed <laughs> i don't i don't care they drink in um, harry potter right don't the kids drink something yeah, butterbeer and dragon uh not dragon whiskey both both yeah. both drinking in 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 those uh yeah i rolled my eyes at it uh it's cool i think it's fine i think it's a cool concept that on this plane because uh, like you're also like new Capenna is about like bootleggers and yeah, yeah. prohibition like, smuggling and like you can't do that without some type of substance like that and the fact that it's this cool angel magic that's been condensed into like liquid ether is dope. I'm, I'm all in. Uh, and with halo fountain, it's extra cool. Cause there's like, uh, if you can make halo fountain into a creature, you can untap, you can use the untap ability on the creature. So like, uh, the way things before a colon work within the rules of magic is you can do any of the abilities in any order. So you, mm-hmm. you can tap it. And if it's a creature, you can then untap it as well so you can use it for both halves of that ability uh and so if you have a creature that taps for two white or more uh and this and this is a creature you use you know insole artifact the new one that's probably better the staff from the dungeons and dragons set it's like one blue and then you can tap something to make it into a creature and it stays untapped um or a few other ways to do it and you make any creature that can make more than two white mana uh you can just draw your whole deck yeah, it, 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 we talked about this card. We actually did like a, a fairly lengthy breakdown of this card. I think two weeks ago on our preview episode when they were just starting to preview. So we we kind of oh, talked about it then. So we might have talked about it then. Okay. We did. Yeah, yeah. We we, we kind of we, we talked about that. But I mean, it's good to, to retouch on it again. So um, continuing to 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 move on. I believe we also already spoke about Elspeth Resplendent. I'm barely certain. I think it was. Yeah, yeah I think out. I think the next card we're going to talk about is Vivian because this has started seeing actual modern play. So yes. Uh, the next card on the list, uh, and this is in price and Elsbeth and Lord Xander are the next two, but we talked about those on that previous episode. We did talk a little bit about Vivian, but uh, where it's now having seen modern play and we can kind of talk more about it. Uh, so Vivian is four green green for a legendary planeswalker Vivian for a four loyalty planeswalker plus two. You may sacrifice a creature. If you do search your library for a creature card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrificed creatures mana value, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle birthing pod plus one mill five cards then put any number of creature cards milled this way into your hand 
a very cool draw card effect. Minus one, create a 4-4 green rhino creature token. No ultimate ability. So just rhinos for days or birthing pods for days. Um, So uh, there is a, this is a two card combo in modern. Uh, If you have um, this in play with a three drop, uh, you win the game. Uh, just, just automatic, not automatically, but through the chain. So basically the way it works and, and the coolest way to do it is you use plane bound accomplice. Hopefully that's showing up on the screen right now. Uh, plane bound accomplice is a two and a red creature for modern horizons that for one red mana, you can put a planeswalker from your hand into play. Uh, that's just at, at, at instant speed. So if you have a plane bound accomplice and you untap with it, or you play a plane bound accomplice with one red mana, uh, extra. So on turn four. You then put Vivian into play. You then use Vivian's plus two to sacrifice Plain Bond Accomplice or any other three drop. You then go and get Felder Guardian. Guardian. You take Felder Guardian, you blink Vivian. Vivian then can use its ability again. Vivian then sacks the Felder Guardian, going to get Karmic Guide. You get Karmic Guide in the play, which was printed in Modern Horizons 2, in the Modern Horizons, in the Modern. You then use uh, Karmic Guide to reanimate the Felder Guardian, blinking Vivian. Vivian goes away, comes back. You sacrifice the fellow Dark Guardian again. You get a Kiki Jiki. Kiki Jiki comes into play. I uh, use Kiki Jiki to copy the um, Karmic Guide. The Karmic Guide, re-getting fellow Dark Guardian, and now you have infinite fellow Dark Guardians and Kiki Jikis. What's cool about this is that this combo also fits very, very well with Sahili Ray combo because you can use the Plane Bound Accomplice to get Sahili Ray into play for cheap with the Felder Guardian already in play. Uh, or really good with stuff like teferi where you can just you sneak a teferi into play to make it so you can do everything i just described without your opponent being able to interact with you uh and it is already seeing play in um where is the deck list sahili combo uh yorion type decks that are playing the full cat combo plus the full uh vivian combo plus a bunch of different planeswalkers like renin six and so you get to play that whole deck while also because you're playing a Urion deck you just can kind of up your thing eldritch evolution is in the deck uh oath of nissa like you get to play all these really powerful cards it's really cool uh, i love this deck a lot <laughs> yeah it's really cool i mean it's, it's it's cool it's clever i love the way that it all interacts it seems like it's a a good combo deck i mean it seems like it's you know the plane bound the plane bound accomplice piece of it is really interesting because it adds a layer like a cheater layer to it that is like really like quick and cool. i don't think this combo i don't think well there's two pieces a i think like counter cat has been our thing right it's always been like on the edge but it, this makes it a little bit better playing that accomplice makes the vivian gameplay and go from like cute and bad because you're playing a six drop planeswalker to oh you have an instant speed once you get this into play uninteractable or like non-priority sacrificing combo available to you yeah that's well, weird. <laughs> you, can't, you can only do it on your turn, though, correct? You can't. You, you like you don't, yeah, you don't yeah, get the ability yeah. to interact. Vivian doesn't get the the instant speed play on your opponent's at, you know turn ability. Actually, sure, sure, sure. But but you can do it with using priorities, right? Um, yes, yes. And yes, you yes. can flash in like to ferry in at instant speed um, during Protect, the yeah. end step, right? Can't you do it? Yeah, yeah. If you if you activate plan bound accomplice on your opponent's end step, you can keep to ferry into your next turn, making it so they can't do anything. Yeah, until the exactly until the beginning of the next end step. You also get the whole priority once like Vivian comes into play off of Plane Bound Accomplice. You can then sack it before they can kill the Plane Bound Accomplice. You can then there are parts of it that you can respond. But the cool part about it is if they try responding, you just have a Vivian in play. Yep. Or whatever you tutored for. Uh, but yeah, deck is sweet. Uh, anything else on Vivian? No, I think Vivian's cool. I, I'm glad. Yeah, glad to talk about it again. But I think that card is uh, this is very good. It's yeah. I mean, I actually think so far of the cards we've talked about from the set. I think Obnixilis will be a good value card. I think Bootlegger Stash is going to be a legit combo card. And I think so is Vivian. Like the set has offered some pretty, those are legit like modern cards. You can tell the way that they're, they're, they're the way they're designed, what they do, they will see play in a significant way. And that not every set can say that it has three or four or five that are like yeah. key cards. I think, I think of the, yeah, of the cards we've talked about, Halo Fountain and Bootlegger Stash are the lowest chance of seeing modern play, but we'll see tons of play in other places while Luxury's yeah. get gift Obnixilis and Vivian so far ha- all have tons of potential. And like we skipped all of the lands. We're not talking about, but we talked about that last time. Every single one of the five cyclable yeah. fetchable yeah, yeah. try lands are modern playable. Uh, next card is professional face breaker, professional face breaker, two red human warrior, two, three minutes. When, it, whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, sacrifice a treasure or create a treasure mm-hmm. token. You can sacrifice a treasure token to the exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. Um, 
So fun things this card can do is when Ragavan or a Dragon Rage Channeler does a damage to your opponent, you get an extra treasure or your first treasure token off of it. And then you can use those to draw cards. Yeah, I played against this at the pre-release. It was a real pain in the butt. Uh, this card, definitely very good. Uh, lots of value. There's so, I mean, there's just so much uh, treasure generation in general in Magic right now. And like, as you mentioned, the biggest, most significant, most played one, um, at least in modern, if we're not talking about uh, Dockside. But the most played one in modern is definitely Ragavan. And uh, this is perfect with Ragavan. It's even the same color. <laughs> And yeah, it's whatever yeah. one or more creatures you control, you'll combat damage. You get a creature like so, like you just play this, and you're already attacking with a Ragavan. It it's pretty uh, pretty bananas. Um, it does have like the problem I have with all three drops that I wish this was a one for. Oh sure, because it's just bolt. Yeah, I guess what's nice about it is that if you play this, you can immediately sacrifice the treasure from a Ragavan. Right, like yeah. it, it, and and get that exile effect. Now you have to cast it this turn, which makes it a little awkward. But you can also, if they don't have a removal spell, the turn you cast it, you can get a treasure off of it at least, because the creature you have in play is the one that can deal damage, not necessarily them. So there's some benefits to it. I think it's like just off the edge of modern playable, but maybe pioneer playable. Like not having lightning bolt in that format does make a big difference. I think you would play this. I mean, I don't know how realistic it is that this and Ragavan together would like birth a blue red control archetype, but there is a part of me in my mind that thinks about this card and Ragavan and cheap counter spells and bolts and playing this on turn four when you have one blue mana open and you can either fake like you have a counter spell, a spell pierce or anything with that new one that just came out, or like even if you don't, you've now got access to probably at least one treasure from your Ragavan, if not multiple. Plus, like the Ragavan comes down on turn one and then sacrifices its treasure the next turn to get this into play. So this comes down on turn two if you just want to turbo it out. Um, I do think there is a there's a blue red treasure control archetype that I think is totally legit that like can play Aether Grid in the sideboard. They can bring it in if you like can't attack anymore. I, I think there's cool application. This is a very powerful ability. You can yeah, play yeah. the card this turn. You don't have to cast it. That means you can sacrifice a treasure to get a hit a land drop if you need to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Titan of Industry, four green, 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 elemental creature, seven, seven, reach, trample. When this enters the battlefield, choose two. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Target player gains five life. Create a four, four green rinder creature token. Put a shield counter on a creature you control. I love um, this card <laughs> for a couple of reasons. First of all, the... It's like a giant green like beast thing that's eating buildings. Like no, 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 I love it, is, it is the buildings. Oh, 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 it is the buildings. Okay. It's Titan giant, it is, it's just a giant building elemental. <laughs> it's epic. Yeah. Titan of Industry also, it's like a cool name that's like reflective of like Nuka Penna. I, I, yeah, I like that. I think it's clever. It's cute. This card's awesome. I think this card would look great in a foil too. The art's really cool. Um yeah. I do think that like a seven, seven reach trample that can put a shield counter on itself and then also get something else really good. I don't know what deck wants this because it's not like you're not getting like a gristle brand or some craziness like that. But I do think that green decks that are like just getting giant things into play green decks that are that are playing big mana acceleration and just like want to have good threats that do something. There's a couple things about this that are really necessary. Right? Like one of them is the fact that this has a naturalize on its face. So it's a good card to have in any kind of a like ramp toolbox style deck because you get a seven, seven reach trample that protects itself. That has a naturalize just in itself. That's just a good thing to have. It's a win condition that also probably gets you out of trouble. Yeah, I, I have like two two thoughts on it. One, I think like any Titan deck having this as a one of like decks that have like green tutors that can find a single target that have yeah. ramp to be able to put a seven drop into play. Like this is going to be decent in every game possible and is going to be great to shore up random matchups. You're like, oh, I need to get rid of this artifact hate card that's stopping me or I need to get rid of this one threat that is hard for me to get rid of. It's also good at stabilizing, right? Like. Sometimes Finally. Primeval Titan, you just die to burn because you cast your Primeval Titan and they got you to low enough life total. Instead, playing this and getting a 7-7 seven, seven and a 4-4 four, four 
and of gaining five life. And then if I'm burn, I'm sad <laughs> and probably losing. So like this has like the stabilizing effect, which I really like to it for those type of decks. The other place is that this isn't legendary, which means that this can be persisted into play, which this is maybe one of the top three reanimator targets in modern to the fact that persist is maybe the best reanimator spell in modern. So you can, you know, it's this or Archon or the angel angel of, sanctity whatever the one that gives you protection from a card permanent of your choice uh all three of them are like really powerful this one gives you a lot of options that the other two two don't as well right so this like build stabilization it kills you really quick that's seven damage of trample it blocks flyers like i think i think this card's like underrated probably in modern in decks that want to do reanimation or cheating things into play or are ramping really quickly i responded pretty fast i mean it is notable to think about the big green creatures that have come out over the last few years, none of which have really made a big impact in modern. Like whether you're talking about Elder Garganoth or like anytime they've tried to give us like some lots of text on a great green creature that costs six, you know, five or more. So a lot of those involve like, attack triggers or don't stabilize yeah. very well or don't protect them. Like this does the like it's a there's a reason Cryptic Command is good, right? Like imagine if this was just cryptic command green like four mana for this as a green card yeah i definitely think i definitely think that your point is that like i can imagine a world which you're not protecting this and it's getting you a seven seven of four four and five life and it's like yeah good luck killing me now like you right. thought you, good good luck blue red tempo deck that thought you had it i have a seven seven with reach that blocks your phoenix you can't bolt it i have a four four i'm gonna be on the offensive with 11 power pretty soon and i just got five life mm -hmm. what's what are you gonna do are you gonna bounce this you want to bounce my 7-7 seven, seven and let me play it again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. Like, I think, like, it it puts a lot into play and it protects you, right? A 7-7 a seven, seven reach trample that gains you 5 life or makes yeah. it second 4-4, four, four, like, blocks on the ground well, blocks in the sky well, attacks over whatever they're using to block you well while leaving a blocker to protect you and can protect itself from removal with the shield counter. And then in a pinch is just a good removal spell. You get rid of an enchantment and an artifact is going to be relevant. I think, yeah, I, I actually really do think that the naturalize on its face is one of the most significant parts of it. So the next card we're going to talk about here, unless you have anything else to say on that one. Next card we're going to talk about here is Yada, which is white one for a legendary creature angel, 2-2, two, two, flying vigilance. Each other angel you control enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it for each angel you already control. And it has an ability of tap to add one white mana, spend this mana only to cast an angel spell. I'm stoked on this card i may build a commander deck around this card i probably will in fact but the luxury Giada's gift we talked about earlier her sword uh you know so she's handing out swords um yeah there's really cool stuff you can do with a lot of cool angels that are not like seven drops right people forget that there's a bunch of power like resto angel there's a powerful there's the new wall of omens angel the two one that draws a card and gains a life there's also just like some generically powerful stuff at those levels and like this ramping into those is really good and then getting like to automatically give every creature that comes into play it's you get it comes with an additional plus one plus one counter for each angel you already control so exactly. like every angel starts you start making like seven seven flyers really quickly with this card um and it ramps it's a ramp spell for those cards you can just pay a four drop on turn three and four there are some very powerful like linvala is an angel that's really good, right? There's like some really powerful four drop and three drop and five drop angels out there. What's the name of the card that I used to like so much? Luminarch Ascension. That's the one. Mm -hmm. White one enchantment. At the beginning of each opponent's end step, if you didn't lose lose life this turn, you may put a quest counter on Luminarch Ascension. One I white. Think that one's great. hard to do. Um, in, in, I think that there's pro probably. I it, it came to mind when I when I saw this card. Yeah. The yeah. fact that it's a repeatable angel maker. Uh, I, Alex cut me off, but basically it's a repeatable angel maker for two mana. If you have four or more counters on that, you can you can start making angels every turn. I think there's probably better versions, but there's a lot of cool stuff that makes angels that are not six, six, like six mana, seven mana. Like you said, I'm, that's kind of what I was getting at. I'm looking at entreat the angels. Yes, there you go. Give me give me that miracle five angels in the play that are each 11 11s. <laughs> Yeah, ten tens. <laughs> Pretty good. How much does Entreat cost to to cast? The miracle the is white, white X. If you just draw it, it's X, X, white, white, white. So it's like five mana for a four, four angel. Here it's four mana, right? Like, or I guess Giada can't. 
you, you cannot use Giada the cast and treat the angels, but it's still dope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean Giada card. You could play like some. Well, you could play like a blue white because wasn't there also the the the, the loser, illusory angel? Isn't that an uncommon that exists? It's like a four yeah. four for three or something. I think they're bad. Yeah, that is a card though for sure. There's like the, I mean, there's stuff that's like in that range though, right? That are like that are like four four angel for three kind of a deal. There's a bunch of stuff like that. There was that angel yeah, from. Yeah. From uh, there was that angel from the third Innistrad block set, the one that that uh, God, my brain is not working tonight. The one that Avison is from, uh, Avison restored. Uh, there was like that three mana one that, like, when you play it, like bounces something like, back to your hand. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the three four that returns. There's also like feather, right? Like feather decks could oh, play yeah. this. Feather's good. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a lot of really cool angels that you could. I I I think. I'm more There's excited also like, like resplendent angel, right? Flying at the beginning of the end step. If you gain five or more life, the stern create a four, four white uh, angel creature token. There's like resplendent Marshall, which when it enters the battlefield or dies, you may exile another creature card from your graveyard. When you do put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control other than resplendent Marshall that stares a creature type with. Yeah. Exile. Like there's like cool stuff. There's a bunch of like new Kaldheim angels that are three drops. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's cool stuff here. I, I don't know if it's like full on modern playable, but it's close. And and even that enough is pretty sweet. I, I feel like I'm mostly excited for this card for Commander, if I'm being honest. That's where I really want to explore it, because I think there's like sure. really cool stuff with it coming down on turn two every time. But I do think there's probably a, an interesting modern deck. The next card we're going to talk about is Void Rend. White, blue, black, instant. This spell can't be countered. Destroy target, non-land permanent. We got a Divin's, Dovin's Veto for Negate, and now we got Void Rend for... Uh, I was going to say terminate because that rhymed, but which is close, but I would vindicate. Oh, that also rhymes. Let me do that again. We got Dovin's Veto for Negate, and now we got Void Rend for. Oh, I forgot the card name again. Vindicate? Oh, this is Vindicate. <laughs> Leave it all in. Uh, no, Void Rend, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff about Void Rend that's dope to me. So it's, it's black, white, it's black, white, blue for an instant. This book mm-hmm. countered, destroy target, non land permanent. Okay, first mm-hmm. of all. Mm-hmm. The art on this card is so dope. It's like some of my favorite art in the entire set. Okay. It's okay. Like, it's like a person disappearing. It, like they're uh, being bit, bits of missing agent were discovered in various ally alleys across all three boroughs. So it, it's someone uses teleport magic to rend someone into millions of little body parts across. the. It's list. like really cool. I like the idea of it. I love the colors. I love the design. It feels like comic book art, which is some of my favorite stuff. This feels like something I'd read in a comic book as a kid. And it was really cool. But mm-hmm. more than anything, I just think this card's epically good. I like I think that like a like a like Esper vindicated instant speed that can't be countered is just excellent. I, I just think like that I it, it has the trap, I think. This is what I'm expecting to happen. I think I'm going to think this card's really good. And then I think I'm going to start playing this card. And then I'm going to be like, it costs me three every time. I want to play things that cost me two that are not as effective as this, that I can play more spells. And I want one of these in my deck. But right now when I'm looking at it, I'm like, this is so good. It does what? so many things. I like well, uh, I like a few things. One, I like that, you know, this is because it's an instant. It plays great in Esper draw go like strategies, right? You're able to sit behind stuff and this can be in your hand. And it basically is a like, no matter what my opponent does. I will have something that it will it will die, right? If, yeah. if it worst case scenario. Um, I also like that it is two of the best colors for that type of deck because you can exile it both the solitude or force negation. So you're able to like like gold cards are powerful in modern right now because the more colors you have being able to exile it towards a a uh, solitude or a grief or a force negation or a um the blue one. Oh, subtlety, uh, subtlety, subtle, subtlety. subtlety is like a very powerful backup plan for just an answer to everything and they can't stop you from answering it. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think the fact that in modern, this is going to be a playable card that hits such key pieces of the free spells that also is just a very good draw in a lot of cases. What like what situations can you think of where drawing this will be bad? I guess the only ones I can really think of are your opponent has some kind of protected threat, like a like a hex proof type of a thing or a protection threat. That's the thing killing you. Um it, like drawing it against the Ragavan that's already hit me twice. 
like it's not bad, but like if they're like sitting, yeah, in okay. like, I'm, I'm saying when will it actively be bad? The only times it'll be actively bad are if you're playing against I get like a burn deck. If this isn't your main deck and you draw this against yep. like burn, it's like, yeah, I think it's I think it like is just very versatile for sure. Yeah, I would agree. One of my one of my favorites. Uh, our next card is uh, probably one of the most powerful cards in this set. An offer you can't refuse. Blue, instant, counter target, non-creature spell. Its controller creates two treasure tokens. Instant. Um, so this is just like the inverted spell pierce. So instead of like counter target spell, unless they pay to, you guarantee counter their spell, but they get to for later. <laughs> Yeah, we talked about this definitely. We definitely talked about this one at length on that preview episode, but it is worth noting again, only because I do think this card's going to see a lot of play. Um, your opponent having two treasure tokens, it's fine. It's bad for you early. You don't want to do that early. It's reminiscent of a path to exile. Like, you don't, I don't want to path your noble hierarch at all. <laughs> it's a bad mm-hmm. thing for me to do. Um, that being said, the situations where path to exile is good are many. And they are not usually isolated to the early games. The same thing here. Like, I'm not going to counter your turn one lightning bolt with this card. Probably. Right. right. Like the, 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 the moment, the worst card this card is at countering is Thoughtseize and Inquisition of Ko's like, right? That's, that's the like, the one time you're like, maybe you do it because maybe you have another card that if they get you, you just can't win. But now you've ramped them to turn three on their turn one. But the difference between this card and Spell Pierce that is so significant is that Spell Pierce sucks the same way Mana League sucks after a certain point in the game. You don't want it anymore. Like when you get to certain midpoints in tempo matchups that have to turn into control matchups, it's like Spell Pierce is a dead card. This is never going to be a dead card if you're playing against almost any deck. And also by the time it gets better as the game goes on because you don't care about them having two treasures once they've got seven lands. Like who cares? Yeah, Great. It, it's it. You're losing marginally better for turns one through three for something that is better any turn after that and better against a significantly larger amount of matchups. Yeah, this card's really good. I just feel like this card is it's a good indicator of like that magic design as the years go on and they design more cards. They are more willing to push and explore certain areas that seem like they're kind of you know, this we've been stable with this idea for a long time. Like the idea that this card's getting printed is like you guys are clearly don't feel like Spell Pierce is that powerful anymore. Like it's a powerful enough card, but it's not like a top tier thing. You're okay pushing mm-hmm. into the next tier now. I also I also think just like in general, treasures, and this is I think a weird conversation happening right now, right? I think treasures are an immensely useful tool. They're just like an immensely powerful. And I think food and clues are also this, right? I think tr- artifact tokens are this immensely powerful tool for magic that like, there's a reason they keep coming back to this. Yeah. And they're a tool that hasn't been fully searched yet. Right. Pretty significantly. And so there's just so many new stuff you could, there's so many new stuff you can do, including giving your opponent treasures as a drawback, right? They're like, we haven't seen a lot of that. That's really cool. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, I mean, people joke on like, this should have been a white card, but I would love to see a path variant that gives your opponent three treasures or two three treasures. Three treasures? That seems savage. I don't savage. Well, you know, whatever that power level needs to be. But like praying a one mana exile effect in the standard is always like suspect. So you know, a sorcery that gives them two or an instant that gives them three, I think would be cool. Maybe tapped treasures, like three tapped treasures. That's for one so, white. so bananas. I would never play that card that, for standard. Maybe I two, maybe T- two tapped treasures. I can see, but even that's a stretch Two like. Well, I mean, you. I mean, two untapped treasures for one white exile is is better than this card. I think better than an offer you can refuse. Yeah, two tapped treasures feels like about on par with path. So it's around the same path is okay. obviously the land is reusable. The two treasures are not, but it still accelerates them in the same way that like if on turn two you play, I mean, nobody plays dark Confidant really anymore, but like you play your young pyromancer or your Tarmogoyf or your, whatever you're playing on turn two that I'm worried about. And I'm like, all right, this is an important creature for me to get rid of. I'm going to kill it with my thing. And then you're like, great. I untap. I'm at five mana now. Like that, like it's pretty rough. <laughs> That's a rough spot to be in, even though it's let it's more temporary it's still a heavy bump anywhere early in the game. I would still say path is better than that card, but I'll bet you that thing you're talking about two tap treasures probably does get printed at some point. Right. Right. 
Or you know what? Maybe here, the other thing that they could do is they could print a restriction. Exile target creature with CMC four or less, create one treasure. Like something like okay. that, where it okay. like only interacts with like that less expensive. I'll talk about this. Uh, Angel of Suffering, three black, black nightmare angel flying. If damage would be dealt to you, prevent the damage and mill twice that many cards. It's a five, three. So this is a very good way to not die. Yep. Cost five mana, which is not an easy way to get in. It is a relevant creature type now with angel. Uh, it's a cool black angel. Um, what are your thoughts on Angel of Suffering? Well, I think it's interesting because there are plenty of cards that reshuffle your graveyard. And I think that if you protect this creature, you get it down on the battlefield and you are playing Gaia's Blessing or any of the other cards that are easily playable. I'm trying to remember, I, like, I know Blightsteel reshuffles itself. Emrakul reshuffles the whole graveyard. Though. All the, all, Correct. all. Yeah, if, you have, if you have this and an Eldrazi in your deck, you can't die unless they kill the angel. Right. So there, there's something interesting about Angel of Suffering being in the same way that like, uh, platinum angel can exist in that same like mm-hmm. I get this down I just have to protect it sort of yep. world and it costs less it only costs five as opposed to seven it's also a threat like a good threat it's a five yep. three for five mana that like flies um, it is sadly a five three three <laughs> <laughs> I mean I do think depending on how easy it is to search for this card, like what exists in modern that can search for this easily. I mean, there's lots of creature tutor, like t- plenty of it. I there, there, like that's a deck. <laughs> that's a deck right there in itself. Yeah. It's like a control deck. It's like, it's like angel of suffering control is an archetype already that should just, it'll probably just exist. Cause like, if you just play like lots of removal, sorry, lots of, lots of control cards, like hand disruption early. So before you cast one, you're just ripping their hand apart. And you play, I don't know if it's playing blue, but it probably plays blue so you can counter stuff. Mm-hmm. And you just make sure you've got, you know, two or three different cards in your in your graveyard that uh, reshuffle. So they can't just like uh, exile one of them and then it's gone forever. You have to have more than one. So there's a lot, I think there's a lot of decks that can deal with it. But like, yeah, that, that seems like a pretty, a pretty viable way to win the game. Just play this, yeah. remove your blocker, make you can't kill me. And then you have to just deal with my angel. It does a really powerful thing for not a lot of effort. Um, for sure. Also, killing someone with a nightmare angel will always be cool. Great. It feels great. <laughs> uh, unlicensed hearse, two mana for a artifact vehicle, crew two, exile up to two target cards from any a single graveyard. Unlicensed hearse does power and toughness are each equal to the number of cards exiled with it. So this is on turn two, a graveyard hate card that just like slowly becomes a massive threat and it's hard to deal with until they want to deal, you know, until that you want it to be a threat. And in the meantime, you get to be a graveyard hate card. I've already seen this see a lot of play standard and pioneer. And I think it has potential to be just like a good hate card in modern. It's competing with Urza Saga Tutor targets, but the fact that this is also just like a cool, good threat that you can main deck kind of a scavenging ooze option seems really cool. Yeah. Well, I also think that there's the added, there's the added element. Well, there's two. There's two major added elements. One of the fact that this is colorless. So this goes in any deck, which is great. Right. Scavenging Ooze is pretty heavy green. A lot of the artifact or, or or graveyard removal stuff that exists is like fairly targeted. It's color heavy or it's utility. This is a threat that in almost, it only has crew two. In almost any deck will have plenty of things to crew this with. And you can also mm-hmm. exile cards from your own graveyard. It's not just from your opponent's graveyard. It's from a single graveyard. You exile your own fetch lands. This thing comes yep. down early and if in your main deck and if your opponent's not playing a graveyard deck, you just drain your graveyard slowly. And by turn five, this thing's like a seven, seven or something like that. And now you crew it with your Raghavan or you crew it with your whatever creature you're playing, Snapcaster Mage and our confidant. Boom. Yeah, there's a ton, ton of different two X's that like get eventually blocked off by what your opponent's doing. And now you have a big threat to be able to defend yourself with. Seems it seems to me like a kind of a no brainer card. I mean, it'll be interesting to see as time goes on if it's just if it's just too clunky, too slow. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I'm not totally sure if it's if it, if it like by the time this gets to turn five or six and you're attacking for like seven or something like that. Incidentally, in the in the decks that it's not supposed to be there. Right. Is that just like, why am I playing this? This card's bad. This should be a sideboard card. This is a sideboard threat that I could play. But if I'm going to play this in the sideboard, I could probably play something that'll nuke the graveyard deck. I'm afraid of instead of get two cards at a time. It's that whole thing. 
Right, um, right, right. Feels like the kind of card you only really would want to be playing if you were playing it in the main deck, because if you're going to bring it in against a graveyard deck. But I don't know. I honestly, it could be that two cards at a time, and having a threat attached to it is just enough. It, I like right. this card. I think this card's cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it. I think it's really cool. I'm, 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 I'm on board. Next card we're going to be talking about is Scheming Fence, white, blue, human citizen, two, three. Uh, as Scheming Fence enters the battlefield, you may choose a non-land permanent in play. Activated abilities of the chosen permanent can't be activated. Uh, Scheming Fence has all the activated abilities of the chosen permanent, except for loyalty abilities. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate those abilities. This is a Planeswalker removal spell that you can find with Collected Company and Humans decks. It is a human, importantly. It does like turn Planeswalkers off. It also just steals the abilities of creatures that you can you can turn off. You can't get lands, you can't get fetch lands. That that is a slight difference than something else. But you know, there's a history of really good blue white two two like humans mage. in modern that have hate abilities attached to them, and this is another one that is powerful. Yeah, pretty it's pretty good. It's two three as opposed to a two two or a two one. It's got a little bit more a little more heft. Uh, in a human's deck, what that means is it blocks this comes Ragavan. down. <laughs> Say what? It blocks Ragavan is what partially what it means. Yeah, well, it also means that if it comes down after Athalia's lieutenant, or they don't really play Mare anymore, but uh, like in any of those humans decks, if this comes down and it's bolstered literally at all, this thing's a three four. It's out of bolt range, um, harder to interact with. I think this card's good. I don't think this card's going to be more like all those two drops, whether it's like Unsettled Mariner or it's Meddling Mage. Like there's so many different versions of those cards that have gotten to be played. And slotted like the in fact over the that years. this is kind of a removal spell, especially for Planeswalkers. The fact that you can just like turn off Renin Six or turn off Liliana yeah. or turn off is like, even though you don't get those abilities, you still get a two, three creature that shuts down a, uh, a Planeswalker. I think that's pretty good. Yeah, um, I agree. And uh, before we talk about the last card, Ah, I almost forgot all the shout outs. Uh, so first off, thank you, Ultra Pro, for, for sponsoring this and our Monday Night Commander streams. We do a Monday Night Commander stream every uh, week. Uh, we have awesome guests and we do awesome commander games. Uh, and it's a blast. You should definitely check that out. It's on uh, the Kess Wiley Twitch channel. So my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Kess Wiley. Um, and then also big shout out to Alter Sleeves. We have a cool Alter Sleeve sketch currently. Uh, Inkling Customs is working on it. I can't speak exactly what it is. It is related, though to our uh pre-show that we did on the patreon uh so it you'll you'll find out what that is but it, it'll it'll be exclusive for patreons in a bit but it'll be on alter sleeves and if you go to alter sleeves right now and use uh the code the mm cast or if you go down below and click on the link below you can see all of our some of our favorite alter sleeves out there and if you buy anything through that link and using that code uh alter sleeves thanks us with love and so we appreciate love and so if you can provide love it's awesome you get to put little card sleeves you get to customize any of the cards in any of your decks with really cool artwork and really cool modifiers that's really fun and uh last but not least benjamin i have a trivia question for you i have a question yes trivia a trivial question all right menace a uh is a keyword ability because a lot of the ability counters are in the set menace menace is a keyword ability that replaced fear and uh intimidate as like the red black aggro ability that allows those cards to have some type of uh, evasion that's a little bit different than the other ones and menace is where they landed on uh, just because intimidate was super color specific and fear was and was even more color specific. Um, what year and what set was Menace originally printed as a keyworded evergreen ability? So, like it existed. This is the first printing of Menace ever. First printing of Menace. So before that, cards had uh, creatures can't be blocked. Sure. They had the ability text, but they did not have it. It was not keyworded as Menace. It became it became it became an evergreen keyword with its with its launch. Uh, let's see, menace. Uh, I'm trying to place it. <laughs> uh, memory. <laughs> and and while you're thinking, I'll explain this to everyone. Please, everyone, uh, guess your answers below. So the way the trivia game works is, I ask a trivia question to Ben. He has to answer it. Uh, and in the meantime, you guys also have to make an answer because you've made a bet with us and you don't even know it. Uh, and if you get it wrong, if you don't know the answer and you've guessed wrong in the comments, you have to hit that like and subscribe button. That's the rules. You have to hit the like and subscribe button. If you can't guess the trivia question, that's we don't make the rules. We just do the trivia. Um, and uh, if you do get it right, we will both. I will like it as the podcast or as my own personal account. You'll get a like on your comment. You don't have to like and subscribe. We appreciate it if you do. Um, so, Ben. You've, I've, I've delayed for you, and I have now delayed for everyone to guess. So hit that guess button in five, four, three, two, one. All right, Ben, do you have an answer? 
I'm going to go with it originally first appeared in Innistrad in 2011. Not even a little bit close. It uh, uh, premiered in. Oh, well, OK, I'll give you a little close because <laughs> Innistrad was one of the 10 featured sets in this core set. And that was Magic Origins in 2015. Uh, uh, it was introduced there. And we did Innistrad is one of those planes that was there, you know, because each it was the set. It was the first plane that Liliana ever planes walked to. Uh, very so menacing menace there. Lots of werewolves not on any cards until then. That's what you're saying. Correct. There were cards that had the keyword, the, the ability text of Menace that may okay. have been a rabid post fact and maybe have gotten reprints that now say Menace. But Menace was not a keyword until 2015 and Magic Order wow. was released. Wow. So that was the trivia question. If you got it right, hit that like subscribe button. If you got it wrong or you didn't know it and you didn't comment, hit that like and subscribe button. Just hit the like, hit the like and subscribe button. Got wrecked to the KT. I know. Uh, and the last card we're going to talk about today uh has already seen modern play uh in reanimator decks tainted in indulgence blue black instant draw two cards then discard a card unless there are five or more mana values among cards in your graveyard so this is a blue black instant draw two cards discard a card like pretty amazing loot ability that then late game is just an amazing card draw ability <laughs> yeah i mean it's already already blue black in most decks the draw two discard one is like fine like it's not a card you'd play on its front end if it that was all it did because it would need to have something else but the fact that that's the worst case is that on turn two this is just gonna loot and just like lets you keep lower see it like lets you keep hands with less lands Mm -hmm. lets you stock your graveyard and then like the whole like five or more mana values thing I noticed pretty quickly in limited. It's going to be a little easier to accomplish because you're going to have a lot of creatures that cost three and four and five that are just going to be in spells that cost three, like modern. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a little tougher because I think a lot of decks are going to be heavy on the, on the land one twos that have multiple threes, fours, fives and stuff like that. It's going to be a little bit wonkier, but there's also stuff that has fake casting costs like delve spells, like Tassiger or stuff that it, you're, you're cheating in or, uh, cards that I, I mean, there's, I do think it's going to be hard. I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to be, not going to lie to you guys. I do think that getting, but when it's late in the game in a control deck, well, it will not cause you, hard. cause lands count, right? So you need a land, a one drop, a two drop, a three drop, a four drop and something. Or a, a three, yeah, you need yeah. a land, a one drop, a two drop, a three drop, and then you need a four drop or an eight drop or, a, yeah. you know, like you, I, I think like one of the reasons I think this is seeing play in the reanimator deck is that you want the discard anyways, right? You want yeah. a yeah. Yeah. instant speed, you know, like faithful mending, uh, five, six, seven, and eight option that lets you discard the important cards you need to get into your graveyard, like Archon of Cruelty, so that when you untap, you can just go for it. Right. I think that's that's the real reason seeing play. It also is a gold card, right? Like gold cards are really good in modern now, as we explained earlier, because of the the Free ability spells, to like yeah. remove like this deck is playing both grief and solitude. So being able to exile this to grief or uh, to then get like the ephemerate off is like really powerful. I think I think this card like is really strong and generically strong. And then the moment you add graveyard strategies, it becomes like way, way, yeah. way stronger. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, I like this card. I'm always a fan of I'm always a fan of like two mana instant speed, some kind of draw, like anything. It's almost always like something I'll try to play. So so now that you've seen the set, uh, Ben, what would you say your favorite faction is? Uh, I think probably it's Obscura. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that it's Obscura, but I think it's probably Obscura. I thought you could have been a maestro. Or a or a or a Jun or a, I guess you're not really a rivet here. Is there another? I guess there's only there's only one blue red. It's Maestros. You could have been a Maestro yeah. like me, Ben. I like the Maestros. Have, I mean, they're they're you cool. Could been, you could have been somebody. You could have been <laughs> part of the family. I just like uh, I like connive a lot. I think it's good, and I think it makes it makes sense. So exactly. uh, that. you can have your horns. You can have your horns. Ah, uh, yes, yes. I will. My my Xander is somewhat for some reason. He's uh, like Eastern European. He likes talking. He's from Transylvania. Like, <laughs> you're getting at <laughs> he's a vampire. Uh, well, you know, I think like uh, he finds TV on back of truck and uh, who, who knows what happened to it. So I don't worry about it. <laughs> OK, there you go. Got it. Got it. Uh, 
but yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, either way, thank you so much uh, for all of our sponsors from Ultra Pro to Channel Fireball to Alter Sleeves. Uh, thank you so much to all of our patrons for making this happen. As we said at the beginning, there's 30 minutes of extra content at the beginning of this episode all about Star Wars, plus all the mistakes and little tangents, or if we say a card name wrong or something like that, and the editors did not remove it. It is all on that Patreon exclusive version, and that comes out a week early. That episode gets posted every week by Friday. Uh, and this episode comes out on Tuesday, so you can get all this content way earlier on Patreon. Uh, so definitely check that out. Plus, you get extra content. It's it's definitely worth it. Uh, and um, beyond that, I make lots of TikToks. Ben makes lots of music and lots of TikToks. So you should follow both of us on TikTok. He has a new TikTok account, Ben Bateman Movies. I, my favorite part about my new TikTok account is that you are interacting with it now. You for TikTok, I wasn't. You weren't interacting with my old account. You didn't. For you some reason, there. it never for, like TikTok learned at some point that I didn't want to see your old TikTok account. Well, this TikTok see, account shows up in my feed all the time. I don't see your account on Ben Bateman movies. I don't know what happened. I've never seen one of your posts, and I follow you. I follow seven people. You're one of the only you people to, you I have follow. to interact with my posts. You have to be like uh, liking and and okay. commenting. Just interact yeah. more. Okay. Watching. Yeah, was, you have to watch the whole videos too. You gotta. You gotta. You got TikTok yeah. recognizes. But uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Make, make sure to follow. I make magic content. Ben makes movie content. Um, and uh, there's other dope stuff there as well. Uh, and we'll talk to all of you uh, next week. But before we go, oh, really yeah. quickly, one last thing <laughs> because I just announced last week uh, the summer tour, which is more of a string of shows on weekends, but it's eleven shows over the course of June through September that I had to cancel because of back surgery last October is back on the calendar. Ben Bateman tour.com 11 dates. I did add one date in Atlanta. Uh, the first one's in Ohio and Columbus. It's uh, in about a month. It's on June 10th on a Saturday night. And then I've got Denver and Austin at the end of June. So uh, speaking, speaking check of out. Columbus, speaking of Columbus, that is also the week of origins. So if you're going to the origins convention, we will actually have a booth. Castle will have a booth. We'll be selling uh, battle bosses, other games that we're making, um a new puzzle line that we're launching that involves shows such as haiku and jujutsu kaisen that you should be keeping an eye out for uh and that's all going to be at origins it'll be the first time you can buy it from us and i will be there also playing live that weekend in columbus so uh check it out if you guys have ever checked out my music thanks for listening thanks for checking it out and we will see you guys same time same place next week bye everyone bye guys this has been a production of time traveler media Sending podcasts into the future.